<laughs> so thank you very much for that lovely introduction. Um, I also want to extend my gratitude to the Rachel Carson Center, to the staff, to the fellows, to the students for making my time here such a fruitful and productive one. And I look forward to spending the next few months here as well. Um, so today I will give a brief introduction to my book project, Replace Irish Theatre Environments, and then focus on one aspect of that project, namely how the performative, performative space generated in Samuel Beckett's play, Not I, can be used as a means of thinking about urban environments. So I'm not going to be talking about the big green, green grass of home uh, today. I'm going to be talking about cities, urban environments, and Samuel Beckett's Not I. <coughs> so. Replace is a book about using theatre as a tool to understand wider landscapes, asking questions such as, can theatre be used as a means or a device to examine how deeply embedded we are in the material environment? How can theatre help us think more ecologically and more sustainably? I argue that theatre is the cultural space that is most open to the physical interaction between body and environment. It is a cultural endeavor, yes, but also a physical exploration of space, a spatial practice, a means of understanding the impact of interaction between bodies and environment through a cultural enterprise. As Artaud writes, quote, we must insist upon the idea of culture in action, of culture growing within us like a new organ, a sort of second breath, end quote. The book groups together selected theatrical, radiophonic, and digital landscapes under the umbrella term conceptual ecological environments and argues that performance, that is the exploration of bodies, space, movements, time, ritual, etc., help us to think more inclusively about bodies and environment. I've argued throughout the book that materialist readings of cultural landscapes allow for a deeper understanding of the non-human world a site of ethical concern where the performance, not just of social worlds, role, not just of social roles, but of nature as a whole, can be explored. So, that's the scope of the overall book, and during this talk I'll be looking at one play which forms part of the third chapter of that book, Samuel Beckett's Not I, a play that was written in 1972, where the only participant in that play is a mouth, there was originally another figure in that play, an auditor, a cloaked male normally figure, but that, um, that character has been taken out of most of the renditions of that play, including the rendition by Beckett himself. So mostly all these productions have just one participant and that participant is a mouth. So I'll be looking at the play as a research tool for exploring urban environments and giving two viewpoints or aspects of that spatial performance. Aspect number one, immersion. Aspect number two, alienation. So clearly not I is a performed rather than a real representation of urban space. Does the theatre perform the same urban space as the descriptions of the depleted cities that you see in apocalyptic narratives? Can the figures that populate Beckett's theatrical landscape internalize the elements of modernity that form part of the cityscape and perform that type of urbanism on stage? And is that urbanism sustainable? I will examine in this talk how place is registered in Not I and what kind of place it is. How does the theatrical space of Not I relate to the modern city? How do spaces of interiority, such as the theatre itself, or the thought process evoked in Not I, describe or link to these exterior places? And here we go. So, this is a little explanation on the play. Beckett left strict instructions on how to play the mouth in Not I. The first, don't act, and the second, you can never go fast enough. The first production by American actor Jessica Tandy was at 22 minutes long, deemed by Beckett to be too slow. In fact, he said that she destroyed the play. <laughs> the second, directed by Beckett himself at the Royal Court Theatre in London, was done by Billy Whitelaw in 14 minutes. And the most recent production, the most recent acclaimed production, is by Lisa Duan, again at the Royal, Co the Royal Court, originally at Battersea Arts. And she halved that again, coming in at around seven, eight minute play. The reasoning behind the speed of delivery is to have a play that worked on, in Beckett's own words, the nerves of the audience, not its intellect. 
that it would become a kind of indecipherable, ceaseless white noise, language that is fragmented, dismantled, and broken down. And in many ways, this feature of the play allows the spatial dynamic to take precedence over the meaning of the text. It is a play that closes down the theatrical space where the focus is not on a figure or an actor on stage, but on a body part, a mouth. The actors themselves have been strapped into various braces, their bodies raised up. I have a picture. This is Billy Whitelaw, the full Billy Whitelaw. Um, their bodies raised up so the mouth can appear to the audience to be suspended eight feet in the air. The narrative is rushed, vaguely coherent, and delivered in an anguish prolonged torrent of words. Although dense and barely coherent in places, there is a narrative that can be broken down into an introduction and four movements. I suggest that this narrative and the energy released in the course of the play is suggestive itself of a dynamic materiality and mode of living that is emblematic of urban space. So I have a short clip of the filmed version of Billy Whitelaw. So the BBC filmed Billy Whitelaw playing the mouth. And I am going to show you that now. Just for a minute or two. on and on and on like that for, you know, for between seven, eight minutes and 20, 22 minutes. Now. Now, there you go. The play's breathless and aggressive syntax echoes a life lived at a prodigious pace and vulnerability in the face of the ever increasing speed of modern urban life. This is what I'm suggesting. She starts with the birth out into this world, this world tiny little thing before its time. She sees herself and narrates her life in the third person, arguably a modern tick of storytelling, evident in social media perhaps. She lives her life on the margins, not speaking for the most part, but occasionally erupting into rambling and verbose rants that she cannot control. Quote, mouth on fire, stream of words, in her ear, practically in her ear, not catching the half, not the quarter, no idea what she's saying, imagine, no idea what she's saying, and can't stop, no stopping it, she who but a moment before, but a moment could not make a sound, end quote. One of the most crucial points in Not I, and the reasoning behind the title, is Mouth's inability to accept the traumatic experience as her own. The title refers to a negation of the self, and she insists on speaking in the third person. This denial illustrates Mouth's con consistent evasion of personal awareness. She is unable to process information. The result is a circular, ceaseless performance from where, from where neither the narrator nor the audience can escape. Actually, for the uh, Billy Whitelaw production that Beckett himself delivered, all um, the lights were dimmed, even the t lights, the escape uh, lights, the toilet lights that uh, you would normally have in any production. The light was completely dimmed so that it was total and utter blackness, except for the one mouth on stage. And the result, yeah, was quite um, was oh, traumatic for some, traumatic. Anyway, so one of the most crucial points uh, in Not I, and the reasoning behind the title. Yes, I said it. There's an ambiguity as to whether mouth is a concrete body or not. Paul Lawley has called mouth a no matter, an absence. He describes her as, quote, a function rather than a being, a conduit through which pours the words, end quote. Although mouth has no bodily form, the voice emanating from the mouth presupposes a body. 
the voice is female, and we can also make certain assumptions from the narrative about her life, her abandonment as a child, her marginalization, and that her psychological state is fragile. Her psychological trauma is what drives her to seek dissolution, but what kind of space does the body dissolve into? What environment is the theater space representative of? In many ways, Malk's resistance to fragmentation is a vestige of past ways of living. The modern urban body is one that interacts with its surroundings on a much more intuitive scale. The dehumanizing factors involved in bodily fragmentation certainly can be viewed as apocalyptic. But this breaking down of the body is also radical in its materiality. Mouth is not a body, but a piece of a body. The stage image is of the body fragmented. Mouth has been described as an orifice, and her monologue described as a bodily purging, a physical act. For the audience, the blackness of the space around the mouth and the impression of the mouth is symbolic of all bodily orifices, triggers in the words of Anna McMullen, quote, a body turned inside out and continuously recycled by the voice as waste material. There is no presence, end quote, there is no presence and no physical body on stage that would form a traditional performance. What is being performed is the absence or the end of the individual and the beginning of the body becoming totally immersed in the environment. It is interesting to link this idea with Daniel Dennett's image of the self as constructed through the material we gather in the environment. The self creates a constant narrative devised as we make sense of the world around us. Quote, we do not consciously and deliberately figure out what narratives to tell and how to tell them. Like spider webs, our tales are spun. And for the most part, they don't spin us. They, we don't spin them, they spin us. Our human consciousness and our narrative selfhood is their product, not their source, end quote. The narrative that we, need, we weave to form our own core identity is a direct response from our environment and our sensory connection with it. Perhaps not eyes, not eyes, mouth is an attempt to overcome that divide between body and environment. If not eye relates to the modern landscape, what kind of place does it depict? Does it embody urban narratives and perform the spatial practice of navigating the city? In Walking in the City, de Sarteau argues that the urban space of the street emerges through the embodied person. In moving through the city, we make use of urban space that we cannot see objectively, but feel through our senses, resulting in a more insightful way of engaging the city. As opposed to the God's eye view, where map makers and architects objectify the space from the top down, this is a kind of a situated experience of the city. Firstly, there's the God's eye view, or attempts to negotiate the urban landscape through mapping or reading the space and turning it into, quote, a text that lies before one's eyes, end quote. The omnipresent viewpoint, where we stand outside the urban space as a voyeur, is challenged by engaging with the city through walking in that space. This is an experience of imagining the city as a spatial practice. Mouth's narratives mouth spatial practice in not I is one of moving through a distinctly urban space. I would argue that narratives such as not I show an awareness of this flow of energy between and are conscious of all the body and its place in the environment. The concentrated networks within an urban environment and its inhabitants create a confluence of energies that perhaps could be seen as regenerative, regenerative, regenerative and sustainable. Mouth has become the porous body, with the technological tools of modernity flowing through her. She makes manifest the physiological impact of living in the modern landscape. This focus on the materiality of the body is a process that allows us to narrate on different scales, overcoming the challenge of thinking along microscopic versus macroscopic modes of perception that the Anthropocene debate has generated, for example. Mouth could be deemed an aesthetic narrative of the transcorporeal body, performing the interchanges between collapsing notions of the self and the environment. These interchanges result in entanglements where the body can never be fully separated from the wider environment. The porous body is steeped in the networks of materiality to which it is exposed. Matter thus is agency and illustrates or narrates the global inequalities that have become a feature of the contemporary climate crisis. Her bodily fragmentation, her anxieties, her endless circular narrative is not that of a corporeal body. 
We should not be looking to anthropomorphize the body part, but it should instead accept her as a fragment of living modernity. Mouth has become the modern body, and as such, has become technologized. She refers to her body as the whole machine. She talks about being disengaged from herself as a whole, saying, quote, some flaw in her makeup, incapable of deceit, or the machine, more likely the machine, so disconnected, never got the message, end quote. Perhaps her narrative is not singular, but multiple. Rather than separating her from her environment through embodiment, we should see her as indivisible from her surroundings in the way that an embodied person is not. The city is made up of thousands of individuals that in many ways cease to be individual and operate as one in order to have a more streamlined and cohesive community on an ever-increasing scale. This is not an apocalyptic narrative prophesizing the end game, but an urban aesthetic. Mouth has become a fragmented part of urban modernity in the sense that the energy and forcefulness of her disjointed narrative creates a stage space where the body and environment break down into one entity. The way the play is structured, the rhythm, the speed and the urgency, something that is evident in the clip that we saw, is symptomatic of a pace of life that urban modernity offers. Jeremy Miller and Michael Schwartz have noted that, quote, to possess speed is to be modern. To control speed rather than be controlled by it is perhaps the most important form of contemporary power, end quote. The notion of speed, that, the notion that speed is linked to modernity is a well-established truism, but in Mouth's case, the impact is destabilizing. She lacks power and is unable to, make, to take that power back through moving through the streets, challenging, protesting. The tropes of living in urban modernity, such as the energy, the technology, and the urban space itself, are central to Mouth's way of being. We negotiate urban space differently to rural space. As de Certeau notes, quote, the networks of these moving, intersecting writings compose a manifold story that has neither author nor spectator, shaped out of fragments of trajectories and alterations of spaces. In relation to representation, it remains daily and indefinitely other, end quote. The fragmentation of the narratives of negotiated space is, present, is represented in that eye. Our bodies succumb to the urban space and we become hive-like, supposedly, communicating in new and distinctly modern ways. De Certeau's method for negotiating the city moves away from the voyeuristic experience of the urban city as text and into a more sincere expression, experience of moving through urban space. This is a creative act understood and practiced by those who live down below. It is in the interacting with the environment at ground level that the individual begins to break down. But, and here's the second aspect, not I. Um, and this is from the Beckett on film version of Not I that had Julian Moore playing uh, Mouth, and it differed from all other productions, well, theater productions, in that it, at the beginning, at least, had a full body, her full body on stage, and she goes and sits in this brace-like thing, um, and then it moves in and zones in on her mouth. So, but, perhaps the breaking down of the body into the landscape is not always seen as a progressive and radical act. In Rambling is Resistance, Jason Kosnowski challenges de Certeau's idea of walking in the city by suggesting that in our contemporary modern urban city, the fragmentation of spaces and our inability to transcend them is destructive. Quote, individuals face more and more observation, control and discipline through both spatial and temporal strategies upon the body. Yet the fragmentation of spaces, cities, and regions ensure that individuals do not traverse the entirety of their environment with freedom and creativity, end quote. Negotiating the urban space is not always generative and can be suppressive, particularly to those expressing dissident tendencies, and perhaps we're seeing that at the moment a little bit in uh, the trump apocalypse. <laughs> so which position does Mouth take? Is her engagement with her environment a creative act? embracing the, how the city and its intrinsic modernity have evolved, or is her anxiety a result of her oppressive surroundings rather than the past trauma? There is evidence in Not I supporting Kosnowski's assertion that urban space actually impairs our freedom. There is a repeated ray or beam of light which she mistakes for the moon that shines in her and echoes the ubiquitous surveillance devices used in monitoring urban populations. 
She describes the beam of light as omnipresent, quote, always in the same spot, end quote. Its presence is, re is relentless and, search and searching, quote, ferreting around, painless so far, ha, so far. She initially thinks the beam of light is the moon, but then changes her mind, quote, probably not, certainly not always the same spot, now bright, now shrouded, but always the same spot, as no moon could, no, no moon, just all part of the same wish to torment, end quote. This beam of light is unnatural, penetrating and threatening. In much the same way as large scale surveillance is used in a modern context, the effect is a heightened anxiety and tension. This, the alienating and ominous fragmentation of space is certainly evident in Not I. And this enclosing of urban space is essentially an argument that returns the body to that of the viewer, framing rather than immersed in the environment. The contemporary urban landscape contains within its geographical spaces the concerns that are prevalent in much of Beckett's work. Alienation, loneliness, paralysis. Reem Koolhaas, the architect, offers us the apocalyptic idea of the city as a junk space, the ultimate wasteland of modernity. Quote, a place so extensive that you rarely perceive limits. It promotes disorientation by any means. Mirror, polish, echo, end quote. The city is the site for a failed humanity. <coughs> if we are a product of a narrative, a narrative generated from our surroundings, so what is the space surrounding the talking mouth in Not I? Her anguish monologue certainly reflects the uncertainties associated with urban living. As far back as 1940, <coughs> far back, but, Walter Benjamin writes about encountering the city. He makes the observation that, quote, fear, revulsion, and horror were the emotions which the big city crowd aroused in those who first observed it, end quote. He describes moving through traffic which, quote, involves the individual in a series of shocks and collisions. At dangerous crossings, nervous impulses flow through him in rapid succession, like the energy from a battery. The technology has subjected the human sensorium to a complex kind of training, end quote. This energy, the nervous impulses that, Beckett talk, that Benjamin talks about, reflects Mouth's nervous energy. The experience of moving through the city is impossible, given that Mouth is just that, a mouth. And we're reminded of um, the containment of the artist's body. This is the backstage view of Lisa Duan, um, the most recent production at the Royal Court Theatre, where she's dropped in. Um, the city is certainly fragmented, technological, material, and as Samuel Beckett's Not I suggests, undeniably interconnected. Not I is suggestive of an aesthetic that, while depicting the precariousness of urban living, also proposes an urban body that is capable of complete immersion. Mouth is a body that overcomes the strict binaries of individual and environment and represents the interplay between the two. This may be a utopia, a utopia and a fantasy, but this exchange between, which in many ways depicts urban modernity, should surely mark a more progressive representation of the city than apocalyptic narratives of an unsustainable future. So to finish the talk today for the last few minutes, I would like to focus on one final question. Can aesthetic representations of city move beyond the apocalyptic vision of the future? Now I know that the city is a black hole for rural resources, sucking in energy from the surrounding green zones. But as the majority of humanity now live in urban areas, perhaps there is a need for a new narrative of the city, one that sees it as a harbing, not as a harbinger of environmental devastation, but as a citadel for new forms of sustainability. The impact of the networks of modernity, auto, telephonic, internet, has certainly affected visual culture. Not I opens up a space that echoes this prevalent urbanism and in, not in Mouth, its protagonist, creates a figure that embodies the energy, the interdependence, along with the precariousness of urban living. The fragmentation of the body in Not I goes some way to illustrate the hierarchy of belonging in social space. The people who get to own and control the space around us. And perhaps the idea of matter becoming agential, be it a body part, or humanity as a geological force, allows for narratives that supersede traditional representations of social communities and people, be they urban or rural. 
Now, the notion of a sustainable city is in many ways an oxymoron, with urban areas needing vast swathes of rural resources to support their populations. But I'm suggesting ways that sustainable narratives of urban space can be triggered by what Donna Haraway calls a situated knowledge of the space. The questions on the, final on the final slide here are ways that the issues raised in performative responses to the environment can be thought about and applied in a political and individual way. The growth of the post-natural urban space as a pretentious symbol of excess is an inversion of the utopian ideals of urban living, which was the emergence of a space dedicated to the exchange of culture and enterprise. System, systemic networks built to foster high-density communal living with population moving upwards instead of outwards. How can we envision greener spaces for those communities? How can the negative framing of the city as unsustainable be countered, at least on an aesthetic level? Modernity has created a condition that is antithetical to romanticized ideas of the urban environment. There is no nature. The condition of modernity is that both man and environment have become mechanized. How do we visualize urban centers and urban networks in contemporary culture? Does urban space impair the freedom we attribute to more rural sites? Have we and the environment that surrounds us become automated? And if so, how do or how should we represent that in our plays, our literature, or songs? Now, I know that I'm leaving you with more answers than questions, but in this talk, I argued that it is in the modern urban cityscape that Not I's protagonist mouth resides, and that Not I's portrayal of urban living is essentially a positive one. Not I is representative of how the body, the human body, interacts within the urban networks of the city. The dissolution of the body into the environment, evident in Not I, does not have to be apocalyptic. The emergence of the endless networks found in the modern cityscape can also produce a vital and sustainable space for living, a seamless patchwork that is also a feature of ecological interdependence, reminding us of our fundamental kinship with everything that exists in the space around us. The city is a large part of our future. The urban cityscape is the one that is recapitula recapitulated in Not I. It performs the fallout from urban technological modernization on the environment and consequently because of our enmeshment in that environment on the mind. So thank you very much.